Hey, um, everyone, thanks again for uh, joining in with us for another video. Um, this time we have Orkin Telhan, who is an interdisciplinary artist, designer, and researcher. He's an associate professor of fine arts and emerging design practices in the School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and he holds a PhD in design and computation from MIT's Department of Architecture. And most recently, he has contributed to Biodesigned, our new magazine, um, with a really moving piece about what biodesign means to him. Um, so Orkan, thank you so much for um, being part of this video series. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Alex. Yeah. Um, so in your recent piece for Biodesign, you write that as biodesign is a field, moves across scales both in volume and population, the field's ethical, environmental, and political responsibilities grow as well. Can you talk a little bit about what you think the responsibilities are for biodesign practitioners in terms of ethics and the environment and politics? Yeah, that's a great question because, um, you know, I'm both an educator and a designer, and I, I feel a lot of responsibility when we show things innocently in a test tube, in a petri dish, you know, biology is exciting, students learn design, bring into design, and des uh, learn biology and bring into design applications. But then when things leave the petri dish or the test tube, what kind of implications that they can have to the larger issues in the society, whether it's the environment, whether it's social values, cultural values, or politics. You know, I don't, I think about ethics, not only just, you know, ecology, environment, but also sociopolitical issues related to the ethics, equity, access, uh, social justice, biodiversity, all kinds of things are interwoven to this. So I care a lot about um, showing things in a very concrete level. So students have hands-on experience with biology, so they know how to design with it, but then equally feel responsible for designing responsibly with it, meaning that they think about the implications of their design across different scales. As biology leaves the tubes, again, as I said, it gains a lot of momentum, right? It, organisms proliferate, uh, you know, they increase in volume and they cause a lot of uh, issues when in their in large amount. So we discuss all of these in bigger, uh, and in relationship to bigger issues. And ultimately I call it um, bi responsible biological design. So ethics is part of that bigger umbrella. And I think that's great too, especially because a lot of times students who maybe have a background in bio or design maybe haven't had a ton of formal training in ethics or, po or policy. So it's sort of a way to fold that all in together. Yeah, so I, I mean, I did a number of different degrees in design from product design to architecture and uh, not in none of them there was a class on ethics. Wow. And it looks like ethics is now becoming part of curriculums in science and engineering. But of course, still, the, you know, we don't really teach any design uh, ethics classes in the design curriculum. But of course, biology is uh, design's relationship to living things and biology is also very new. So it is time to really think about ethics in relationship to design um, in, in design curriculum. So for me, I think the most important thing is that what we mean by ethics may also mean different things because ethics like a lot of people make very um, big umbrella statements about ethics so i think there's a lot of um, things hidden in the details so we have to pay attention to that but most importantly we need to uh, make designers be aware of the consequences of their actions and how they are implicating a lot of people who are going to be using their designs or desiring their designs or suffering from their designs Sure, of course. And it's, it's super important, especially as um, biodesign becomes a part of almost everyday life. It's popping up everywhere. And um, you were recently involved in curating an exhibition in Philadelphia um, called Designs for Different Futures. And it was about designing all kinds of food, biomedicine, clothing, the future of every industry. Um, and so what, what are your thoughts about the ways that biodesign will become a part of almost every feature of human existence? Um, I mean, that's also a, a good question, and I, I can explain this probably in hours, but I'll keep it short. <laughs> yeah, let's so keep it the, short. The exhibition in Philadelphia uh, was centered on the idea of how do we think about future 
uh, but different futures that may coexist at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a, you know, very positivist future for all. It's going to be like prosperity and so on for everything, right? So we are knowing that there's a lot of, um, you know, issues that we are dealing with from climate change to social injustice, income inequality, finitude of the planet, pollution, a lot of things. And biology is sometimes the root cause of these problems and also our inability for us to act on these problems. Uh -huh. So uh, in, in the particular installation that I worked on, um, there's a number of different uh, statements that we made related to food, use of you know, synthetic biology or biology design in food. But across the whole uh, exhibition, there were a number of places where biodesign bio, bio made some uh, impact on biomaterials research, biofabrication research, or medicine, grow, grow your own medicine at home uh, kind of uh, research. So it is part of a lot of different projects because I fundamentally believe that biodesign, it's, not going, to, it's, it's going to be a good field. It will mature in itself as an important field but also it will become part of every other design field as well. Biodesign will make fashion design more meaningful. It will enable it both as a technology, but also allow it to make really interesting and uh, important product. But equally, it will be valuable for architecture, product design, uh, graphic design, any design field that you can imagine. So it will, as it, and it will, as it will find these kind of different applications in different design fields, we want designers to think about the future of these fields mm -hmm. as is, uh, biological de design becomes part of their vocabulary. And you're, I mean, you're helping with this, right? I mean, you're in the way that like, you're, you're like a triple threat of biodesign, right? You're an academic and you're an artist, but you're also an entrepreneur and you're the founder of a startup that is actually a company that, that helps these kinds of designers realize what they can do with biology and biodesign. So tell me a little bit about BioRealize and how your products can be used by other biodesign practitioners. Yeah, I think the for us, um, you know, as educators, the most important thing is to really lead by example. You know, we really try to show good practices, what kind of things can designers do, because design education is also studying a lot of other designers or other practitioners of other fields. And the more uh, I work with different biologists, different engineers, bioengineers, and different um, uh, practitioners in life sciences, I realized that there was a big need for designing new tools and technologies that can simplify for non-experts to work with biology. So non-experts could be everything, everyone, right? I mean, it could be a, you know, a designer who can have a lot of expertise in their own world, but they may not have any expertise in biology. Right. So how do you simplify this? For them. Simplification may mean just uh, knowledge. If you can simplify the processes to grow certain things or turn them into applications or um, making, making tools accessible to them because, you know, it, it costs, costs a lot of money to really build labs uh, or do five-year PhDs to be able to really, um, you know, have access to biology education. So we try to, uh, basically with my partner, Karen Hogan at BioRealize, we try to uh, come up with tools and technologies that makes biodesign uh, accessible to other uh, audiences, non-experts, mostly designers, but also um, make examples like case studies, products uh, that can actually be also um, pursued by other designers in their own fields. We work with fashion designers, to, you know, to show examples of biodesign and fashion, apparel, sports apparel. We also work with companies to consult them so that they can understand um, ways to work with biological design to improve and innovate in their field uh, because ultimately it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a workflow, right? I mean, you show the designers, you, get a, you, you excite the designers to work with biology and then you excite the companies uh, to work to invent new biological products so that they can hire the designers that you educate. In the, in the, <laughs> so you complete the full cycle to, to be able to do it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's so exciting for me too and I I actually was really pumped when I was doing research for our conversation um, to hear you talk about the idea of potentially creating bespoke colors of thread um, that you can actually grow. Um, fashion designers can grow their own color dyes um, that they can use for, you know, whether it's for a fashion line or custom piece of clothing for a client. That really excited me. 
Um, so can you just talk a little bit more about the process that you you're working on with the fashion in the fashion industry? Yeah, um, that's a that's a that's a good one because our goal was to really demonstrate how designers can grow biology in their own studio instead of going to a lab and you know um, you know collaborate uh, in a, establish collaborations with other scientists, which is a very valuable model which yeah. we fully support. But a lot of designers want to do things at home, right? Because there's a lot of intuition that you need. You need your own design tools in your studio to be able to really go from one process to another one. So it's very valuable for us to really bring the biology to the design studio. So that project about you know, growing your own pigments in your studio is not like the most essential application of biological design or synthetic biology. But it is one application that shows how from start to finish, designers can work with very low cost and simple tools in their own studio to grow the organisms on demand when they need them for their specific application. In this case, it was growing the pigments and then dyeing the yarn uh, with the pigments so that they yeah. can have a spool of uh, yarn that they can embroider to a denim which then they can sell on Etsy or another platform to, you know, to disseminate. So from growing the organisms to the, dis to the making of the product to the dissemination, it's again a full cycle. Yeah. So for us to demonstrate that, it was very important. And we worked with a uh, um, fashion creative, Sivan Ilan, who was at that time a student and, uh, in, in Philadelphia University, textile design department. So she had no idea about biology. So for us, it was a very good, she was a very good candidate. So she became part of the project. We quickly gave her the tools and the know-how, and then she did everything by herself. And then we helped her realize it. That is fantastic. That, what a great story. And I, and I hope that, you know, as this continues and more and more practitioners and artists and designers, fashion designers or otherwise start coming to biodesign and finding new ways to work with the tools that you guys are producing. It's so exciting. But I'm gonna leave it there because we're gonna be out of time, but thank you so much for talking with me. And I hope um, we get to talk to more about your project soon. Thank you so much, Alex. Great.